um, for our next speaker, um, who is the consumer's voice, I am not going to introduce her. I'm going to ask someone else. So I'm going to introduce the person who's going to introduce the next keynote speaker, which is the uh, famous Dave the Bronkart, also known as E Patient Dave, um, an old timer when it comes to Dev Days, a Dev Days veteran. So I've just been meta introduced, right? The, uh, to those of you who are new to Dev Days or to HL7 in a larger sense, my goodness, why do they have TV screens blocking the audience? The, uh, the presence of patient voices in this organization, in this community is extraordinary. It is out of normal. i never forget the patient community when the HIMSS conference in Atlanta one year granted permission for a bunch of patients to meet in the hall. Right, and this was a big deal for them. And this is like the polar opposite. Uh, if we wanna have the patient, the women's participation uh, expanding here, please put a woman in charge of it, all right? And that, well, and this is not, the, the, there's a parallel here because at Dev Days in Seattle four years ago, all right, some senior people, Graham and others, uh, decided that they, they said explicitly, fire exists to serve patient needs. And not surprisingly, two months later in Atlanta, the HL7 board approved creation of a patient empowerment work group, which has been going great guns. We've been finding our way along. There's a real challenge because a lot of people who want to be involved in it you know, don't have a job in the industry because they're patients, you know? but it's, it's working. And we, I'm pleased to say we have found just in the past few weeks, a major new ally outside of HL7, but coordinating with, it's the Sequoia Project. And on the ONC website, it says that their sole mission is advancing interoperable health data sharing. Uh, and they have right now a consumer voices work group, which has been gathering consumer voices. Uh, I want to introduce Brenda, come on up. Brenda, nicknamed Bren, uh, who is... the Sequoia person uh, coordinating this project, the thing you want to understand that patients know firsthand is that suffering results when health data isn't at the point of need. And that's why this work is important. Go for it. Thank you so much, ePatient Dave. I've been turned on. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So welcome to Consumer Voices, Why Interoperability Matters. I'm Bryn Shipley from the Sequoia Project, and I'd like to thank Reen and Firely for inviting me to be with you here today. Uh, I lead the Interoperability Matters program at the, uh, the Sequoia Project, and please reach out to me the rest of this week or when you get home through LinkedIn, through email, I would love to connect with you to talk more about patient engagement and interoperability. So let's talk today about patient-centric interoperability and what it means and why it matters. So you're living the dream. You're enjoying your life, you're happy, you're healthy. You might be having a beer on the rooftop at a Dev Days conference. Out of the blue, you get some bad news. You're diagnosed with a chronic condition or a serious illness. You're anxious, you're scared, you're worried. You're worried about your health. You're worried about your loved ones, your family. You're worried about your future. In the US, you're also worried that you might go bankrupt because of this bad news. Your whole world turns upside down. You go from having one doctor that you see one time a year for a checkup to having multiple doctors, multiple providers, multiple facilities that you have to engage in with. Each one of these doctors uses a different electronic record system or maybe no system at all. Each of them has their unique way of scheduling appointments with you, of collecting information from you and of interacting with you. So um, this is a world that you've now entered that you wish you knew nothing about. 
you hear vocabulary you don't understand. You're asked to sign documents you don't understand. And despite the digital advancement in seemingly every other area of your life, you have to spend a lot of time with paper forms and on the phone trying to get your doctors to talk to each other. You are left pretty much on your own to piece together your health information so that you can coordinate treatment. And this hassle, this administrative burden of accessing, um, using and sharing your health records, it starts to feel like you're being kicked when you're already down. Ironically, this is the time during your life when you're being asked to make some of the most important decisions of your lifetime. I'd like you to meet your end user, the person uh, for whom interoperability suddenly and truly, truly matters. Now that I've introduced you to your end user, I'd like to quickly introduce you to the Sequoia Project. We are a nonprofit. We are uh, an independent advocate for nationwide uh, health information exchange. And through our initiatives, we bring government and industries together to identify and solve shared problems to make interoperability uh, work better. So you might be wondering, what's with the name Sequoia? Sequoias are some of the oldest, tallest trees on earth, but they cannot reach their great heights alone. It's only through interconnected root systems that they're able to flourish. And the Interoperability Matters initiatives brings together, again, um, healthcare uh, companies, organizations, and government to work to solve some of these shared problems. And today I'm gonna focus on how the Sequoia Project engaged everyday people, patients, and caregivers in their work. <laughs> Great. So, um, we committed to listening to consumers and then acting on what we heard. We put together a very diverse consumer work group. And by diverse, I mean by gender, race, area of the country, sexual orientation, uh, rural, suburban, and urban um, healthcare uh, settings. And although our work group members were very diverse, the stories they shared with us were very similar. Um, the challenges that they went through were very uh, similar. So we're not talking about issues with interoperability in pockets of the country or specific health systems or specific EHRs. The problems that you're going to hear are pervasive. And the benefits of interoperability have not yet reached the end user in the most basic of ways to access, use, and share uh, their health information. So what I'm gonna do, I thought you'd like to hear firsthand from some of our work group members. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play a few trailers um, so you can actually uh, meet uh, the consumer work group uh, members, but I have posted links to the full videos uh, on Whova, and in the upcoming week, Sequoia is going to be uh, publishing its report of findings where you can find a lot more details, but this would just be a little bit of a trailer of a flavor um, for you. So first up, we're going to take a listen to accessing health records. <laughs> Here we go. My name is Shamika Marty. Um, I'm originally from the East Coast, from New Jersey, but I now reside in San Francisco area. It's now really good to have everything online. I still do as a backup every um, summary notes from any visits. I have a big binder. And sometimes the doctors like to see the binder because when they go in the medical chart and then if you read mine, it look, reads like a novel. Hello, I am Mallory and I am from Westover, Vermont. I manage a chronic condition, which means I've had several image studies done, um, all of which are very important in my healthcare career, <laughs> my healthcare path. Um, and I find myself not having access to my images um, not having ease of access to those images either on my patient portal. 
um, have absolutely no access. Hi, I'm Rose. I'm from Middletown, Connecticut. So my PCP is in a different network than most of my other doctors and their network. And it's a large group. It's a large group of physicians. Um, they don't, they use a different type of portal and they find it very cumbersome. And so when I was asking about a portal, cause I have one, um, with other physicians that aren't my main doctor, uh, and they're, it's easier to use. And so when I was talking to them about this portal, they said it's, it's very complicated. Most of their patients are complaining about it because it's just not easy to use. It's hard to, to maneuver. It's hard to find what you're looking for. So they recommended you just not get frustrated and don't use it. It makes it easier sometimes because now you don't have to wait on hold. Uh, you can just message your doctor. But if my uncle didn't have me doing it, he would just be like, oh, my God, I, I don't care. This is too complicated for me to do this on my phone. I did try it and it was hard to even get access to. So I never moved forward with that. Hi, folks. My name is John and I'm uh, greeting you from Atlanta. What would have a big impact would be having a single portal where you can access all of your medical records from all of your providers historically um, so that there wouldn't be that need any time you move and start with a new provider where they have to start from scratch in terms of establishing baselines for your lab work and so forth. It, it would really help everyone. It would help patients and providers, really. I found the struggle and all the extra work of trying to gather my images a deterrent from me going to get another specialist's opinion because of how much work goes into gathering those images and requesting them. It's not even electronic. I have to print out a form, fill it out by hand and mail it back to um, the facility that took my imaging studies. Yeah, I'm on the same portal where all of my doctors are now on. So it's really nice to be able to go into one portal and see all of my information. So upcoming doctor's appointments are there, uh, scheduled tests are there. I, I, you know, I can, have doctors talk to each other and it's just pushing a button and I don't have to, you know, give different phone numbers. It's just when it's all on one system, it just makes it easier. Um, so I, to me, it's making my life easier just because of that. Um, and it's just an easier system to use. It's, it's, it's kind of just self-explanatory. It's not perfect, but I'm able to get around in there and, and find what I need to find. So I want to share with you that as you listen to these voices, you see some kind of happy, optimistic people, but the stories they shared with us were sometimes terrifying and very sad, especially the consequences of when they couldn't access, use, and share their medical records. We heard stories about people rushing a loved one to the emergency room and having another family member go to the home and take pictures of pill bottles to text to the emergency room because medications weren't in the EHR. We heard about um, hospitalizations and people living in pain for days because they had used their patient portal to post requests for medication refills that were ignored. We heard about missed critical second opinion appointments uh, because people weren't able to get uh, images to bring to those appointments. We heard that people wanted to switch um, care providers for better care, but were so fearful that their medical history would be lost that they stayed with a doctor that they didn't really wanna stay with. Um, we heard across the board that um, people found all sorts of errors in their medical records, diagnoses for illnesses they never had, medication errors, um, the embarrassment of feeling like you're a pill shopper because all these medications you never took were in your records. Um, and we heard a lot about um, just uh, the reliance on paper and uh, the runaround um, that people got. So next up, that was accessing health records. So next up, let's um, uh, hear about sharing health records. Hi, I'm Ron, I'm from Denver, Colorado. With HIPAA and with all the legal mumbo jumbo, 
you know, it, it's really frustrating. It should be in plain English. It should be one page that people can read and understand what they're releasing the information to or what their rights are. Hi, folks. My name is John, and I'm uh, greeting you from Atlanta, Georgia. One of the challenges I faced when I moved two years ago from Connecticut to Atlanta was living with a, a serious chronic health condition meant that I put a lot of effort into finding doctors uh, in Atlanta that I could uh, go to and work with. But then trying to get my medical records from my prior doctor in Connecticut was a challenge. And I, I don't honestly know if my new primary doctor here in Atlanta ever actually got them. Hi, I'm Rose. I'm from Middletown, Connecticut. So with the HIPAA form, I think we've all, and me included, I think we've maybe got a little lazy with it, right? Because it's always been the same, or we've made the assumption it's always the same. So, you know, I never even questioned when they just wouldn't show it because I'm assuming that nothing has changed. So I think it's it's important that one, maybe we're not so lazy and we do at least read through it. Two, it's actually given to us. I've had many doctor's appointments where it's like, just to say that you got it when you never even saw it. Or even where they can say, you know what, take a look at this because there have been changes. No, I mean, I have one doctor, you know, on, that I see on a monthly basis. They, they uh, give me the information like five days ahead of time. And I can look through all the information, then approve all the information. And I don't even have to worry about it when I'm at the office that I have to go through. And, you know, you've got, you get there 15 minutes ahead of time and you don't have 15 minutes to get through the documentation. Whereas this is done, you know, on my time. And then I'm able to go through the information, see the information that I'm, who I'm giving permission to, who, who I do want. And if I have changes to who I want to give permission to, I can change that every time I go in, which is really awesome, you know, but that's not true of every doctor I go see either. So as more and more of the doctors get online with and use these kind of portals, I mean, it's definitely helpful. But Hello, I am Mallory and I am from Westover, Vermont. I have a chronic condition that requires me to see multiple doctors and oftentimes I'm seeing specialists on top of that. And every time I go to a new office, I have to fill out pages upon pages of healthcare information from my past or my present. And there's so much information that it's often hard for me to uh, portray all of that information accurately. I don't always have the records to look back on to give them the correct information. So I worry that not having that, that log of information will prevent my future um, treatments from being successful just because I'm relying on what I have in my head, not what is actual records that are medical and accurate to my health. Each time I moved, it felt like not just starting over in terms of finding new providers, but it seemed like the providers had to start over as though I was born yesterday and all the tests and so forth they, they ordered up for me were kind of providing a baseline for their care and treatment of me. But it, it seemed like lacking the longer term history probably was a disadvantage for my providers. And finally, Let's listen to using health records, some of the clips. And again, these full uh, videos are available um, online. Let's, there we go. Hello, I am Mallory and I am from Westover, Vermont. When we can't read the report, it's like, what was the point of the report in the first place? Why did I, you know, get this done? And when your doctor ignores it or doesn't even like tell you that they've acknowledged it. It just feels like it was a waste of your time to go get that blood draw or spend two hours in the hospital waiting when you're just trying to help yourself. And it feels like it's just going into the abyss and nothing's happening with it. Hi, I'm Rose. I'm from Middletown, Connecticut. I, I think I made that mistake once where I actually tried to understand a report. <laughs> and 
it's so far over my head that I was like, I just ended up emailing or uh, sending a message to the doctor saying, can you make heads or tails of this? Because I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is horrible. Like I have all these things wrong with me. And then the doctor would look at me and goes, none of that's true. And, and I'm like, but I'm, am I not reading it right? It, it's just so of my understanding. So I tend to not look at reports anymore because it just makes me panic. Um, I just think they need to be clearer and they need to be in everyday English. Hi, folks. My name is John, and I'm uh, greeting you from Atlanta, Georgia. So, yeah, kind of keeping an eye on what is in the records, it's almost like your credit report where... You know, you want to be sure that the information in there is accurate. My name is Shamika Marty. Um, I'm originally from the East Coast, from New Jersey, but I now reside in San Francisco area. Going to the doctors, they always go through, even if there's something that you're no longer taking and you tell them to take it off. Every single time I encounter where they go through it, I'm like, he doesn't take that anymore. Why is that coming up? Oh, I put to delete it, but it still comes up and you still have to go through it twice because maybe the people who go through it um, don't put the correct dosage or they really don't delete it or it's just a thing where every single drug that you've ever taken is just happens to be on there no matter what and you have to say yes or no and go through everything. I'm Ron. I'm from Denver, Colorado. hope that there's a better patient to development of systems relationship. You know, to really have patients involved in the development and and you know obviously there's going to be patients that just like you know those of us that have been uh, volunteered our time for consumer voices there's going to be patients that are going to be willing to um put their input into development of of uh patient portals and you know it it's not that hard to find and even if you only have a handful of patients that are helping, it's better than no patients. So you're getting it from a patient perspective instead of a, from a clinician perspective. So we all know that technology exists to fix these challenges that the Consumer Voices work group talk about. <laughs> Having trouble with, the, uh, there we go. Can we work towards having all health information, including images and history and advanced directives and emergency contacts in one place that's easy to navigate? Uh, until this happens, our health records will always be scattered. Can we get beyond posting re, uh, records and reports written by clinicians for clinicians when more often than not, the end user does not have a medical school uh, degree. Uh, we are missing the point of patient access if patients cannot understand the information they have access to. <laughs> and finally, in terms of sharing, let's work towards having patients self-direct the sharing of their own information. Um, patients need information not only for treatment use cases like second opinions or if they move, but also non-treatment use cases like, you know, for school and for applying for life insurance. And consumers should be able to uh, share their data uh, the way they wish. And so overall, our Consumer Voices work group says utopia for us would be accessing all of our health information in one place, being able to understand everything that we see in these patient portals, and being able to share records uh, whenever they want with whomever they want. In the days ahead, and when you go back home, I hope you keep these patient voices in your head as you're thinking about your work and your approach to work. Remember their voices, remember their stories, because each one of these voices represent millions of everyday people, of patients and caregivers. So I hope you remember Shamika and John and Ron and Rose and Mallory and what they had to tell us. And I just want to reemphasize that the work you're doing matters very much to people like them. Thank you. Is my mic on? Yeah. Okay. So, Brent, thank you very much. Thank you for your very wonderful welcome. talk. And 
tomorrow, 325 in the Sarah upstairs, there's Q&A for online and for you here at, in Amsterdam, uh, online Q&A meet and greet with uh, Bren. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so before we start the next session, uh, there's a few things for tonight, which is food will be served here in B um, around six o'clock. There's also the Women for Fire reception in the lounge. Um, men are welcome to join the... And we have a few of these wonderful T-shirts, just a few of them, and we will hand them out. Um, I think, Vivian, uh, can you take on that role? Choosing who are the lucky ones to get that T-shirt? <laughs> okay, good. Um, that'll be in the reception, um, the Women for Fire reception. And then 7.30, we'll have the, not pickleball competition, but the Patel competition, right? That's also here. And if you want to join us, I think we're already at 14 or 15 players, so we're good. But if, if you want to join us, you can, you still can. And last but not least, 7 o'clock is the presentation of the winner of the nerds track yeah don't laugh dan 